Welcome in to the Warchant.com report. Oh, and it's an exciting one. I'm not sure we thought it was going to be this exciting. Oh, but it is. Don't forget, 3.30 on Saturday, ESPN with the broadcast. There you see in the boxes, that is Ira Chaffel, that is Tom Wang. I am Jeff. Thanks so much for joining us. Right at the outset, I would tell you, as a reminder, on Saturday, uh, we will have the post-game show for you. Tom, you've got the post-game with Gene. I'm sure that will be a, a moment to celebrate. So don't forget, right after the game, about 10 minutes after the game, join those guys for the post-game uh, breakdown and celebration. Your calls, all that good stuff on Warchant.com, Warchant TV, I should say. So let's just get started here. This has been a tale of two seasons within this first half, really, almost, and I think it's been strange for both teams. Obviously, a lot of people thought Clemson would be a lot better because why wouldn't they be? Six straight playoff appearances. A lot of people thought Florida State was well on their way to perhaps a 1-11, maybe 2-10 campaign after a disastrous start. But uh, big picture here, Clemson's fallible. FSU is getting better and more confident along the way. It's a three-game win streak. What happened with FSU? What led the turnaround? Ira, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's really a million-dollar question or maybe a I don't know, $100,000 question. Ten thousand yeah. dollars. It's a it's a big question, um, you know. And I think when you look at any team that struggles the way Florida State did the first month of the season, uh, and then they start turning things around, it's probably not going to be just one thing. I think it's a combination of things. I think the Jacksonville State loss. Looking back at it, you know, I think Florida State the way they played against Notre Dame is kind of how they're playing now. I mean, they're a decent college football team. I think they can play with the Notre Dames and uh, and other teams in the country in that next tier, not the top tier, but the next tier teams. Um, we started to question that, though, when they went out and lost to Jacksonville State, and I think that sent them in a little bit of a tailspin. Wake Forest was probably the worst opponent they could have gone against that next week because Wake Forest is pretty good and a team that doesn't make mistakes and will capitalize on your mistakes, and that's what happened. Uh, the first half of Louisville was a continuation of that, and at that point, yeah, I mean, that, that Florida State was probably as low as it could possibly be, but since then, they've been like a different team. But I don't think it's one specific thing. I think the quarterback situation getting resolved with Jordan Travis taking over. I think the offensive line getting healthier. It, it's no coincidence that Maurice Smith got healthy. Um, they got uh, Robert Scott back to full speed uh, at tackle. So the offensive line has been healthier. Uh, I also think the defense just understands what they're doing more. Uh, you don't see the busted plays. And I think overall – I think you see a, a team that's just kind of come together, maybe through some of that adversity, uh, but they've re- kind of rallied together. So I think it's it's a whole lot of different things. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's it's also, and this is fair to point out as well, you know, they haven't played the best of competition these last three games. So it's fair to say also that this Clemson game, even though Clemson's four and three and mild, uh, wildly uh, disappointing uh, compared to their normal standards, this will be a big step up in competition this Saturday. Confidence can be gathered in a lot of different ways. Certainly winning football games, no matter who they're against, makes you feel better about yourself, makes it feel like the work you're putting in is paying off on the field. Tom, do you want to add to what Ira had to say in terms of something you may have noticed about why this turnaround now? Because I think Florida State, it's true, have played three teams that are imminently beatable and took advantage of that opportunity. But I also think Florida State's played well. Yeah, they have played well since the second half of the Louisville game. I think part of it is that confidence has built. Uh, Something you said, Jeff, earlier in the season was they need something good to happen to them. Maybe that they don't necessarily deserve, but they need that break so they can exhale and believe a little bit. And I think it goes back to that Syracuse game where you're up nine to nothing. And then out of nowhere, Garrett Schrader decides that he's going to run all over this defense as though he's Michael Vick or something. And then you're up 30 to 20 with a chance to put the game away. You muff a punt. Next thing you know, it's tied. The defense has to make a stop inside of two minutes. They do. And then Jordan Travis scrambles on a couple of broken plays and puts this team in position to walk off with a field goal and walk off with a win. Since that point, you haven't seen those shaky moments. So I think something good happened to them in a 50-50 moment where they started to believe a little bit more. And then since then, it's been pretty comprehensive. Ira hit it on, you know, the, the different phases of the game that have seemed to improve. The one thing that I'm seeing for everybody on the field, both sides of the football, just speaking about offense and defense, not necessarily special teams, they look prepared. They look like what they're seeing on the field is what they train for during the week. And that really does everything for you in terms of playing faster and thinking less. This is a group that's plainly speaking, thinking less on both offense and defense. 
Yeah, and I think the health allows for them to trust their bodies and trust what they see. And, of course, what you're talking about is practice regimen, but they're able to react to that. I think specifically, you look at those three offensive linemen getting healthier. That's made all the difference for this offensive line as a whole. They've gotten a, a nice uh, injection of life whenever Baby and John, Johnson's had to play. I mean, I really didn't think you could depend on him to do anything uh, of great value uh, based on his previous performances. That's not a knock on the kid personally. It's just that he didn't play at a high level, and he's played well when he's been asked to play this year. And then Jordan Travis really getting healthy and believing in what he's doing uh, and, and really taking over that job. And there, there's an aura about him right now that suggests he's very happy to lead this team understands the responsibility, uh, and continues to remain healthy. And, of course, they utilize his legs, which at the beginning of the year were non-existent. So when you have that, then you truly have a special weapon. They are one-dimensional, but that one dimension is pretty interesting because, I mean, he'll make you miss in a phone booth, and he's one of those few guys that can run away from an entire defense if they take bad angles, and he's done that. And that's really given everybody else life, too. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on Clemson here because we're going to break down Clemson in a moment. But I guess we should just overview here. For, for what's gone right for Florida State over the last three games, what's gone wrong for Clemson, I think I'll just start with the fact that their interior of the offensive line, when I watch games and I've watched a lot of Clemson and I watched some more on Sunday because I knew we were going to get excited about this week, well, they don't block anybody, guys. I mean, there's there are moments on the interior of that offensive line, and they've had injuries, and they've had kids who've had to play hurt. At one point, their center was snapping the ball with a broken hand. That can't be good, but that shows you how desperate they've been. They don't block anybody on the inside, and really that's where the hope lies for Florida State right now, and I think it's led to confidence issues for their starting quarterback. Tom, I'll let you start with this one. What do you see from Clemson real quick, overview-wise? Yeah, again, it's the polar opposite of Florida State right now, which is just, again, I'm getting used to that. It's a little bit weird to say and, and express, but you see a group in Clemson that if there's a play to be made, they don't always have the confidence to go finish that play and make it. I'm seeing drops in wide open situations from the receivers, all world players like a Justin Ross dropping the ball in a situation where you got to have it. I'm seeing DJ press in the pocket. His internal clock is completely sped up. He's seeing ghosts, not all the time, because a lot of the time there is legitimately pressure coming right at him from the interior, yeah. but a lot of second guessing on that offense. The defense is fairly tightened up for Clemson that, you know, it, I don't know that it's championship level from two and three years ago, but it's certainly plenty good enough to have gotten them to the places that people were expecting Clemson to go in the preseason. It's mostly with the offense, but what that does is it creates an atmosphere of people pressing. And if you want evidence for the coaching staff pressing, just look at Tyson Pumacon being put into the game against Pitt last week for a drive. They go down the field and then DJ's put back into the game in the fourth quarter. Clemson's got confidence issues. They got issues in the trenches. And also, they've got a burgeoning quarterback controversy on their hands because what happens if DJ and that offense goes out three and out, two of their first three possessions, and even that other possession is something where you have to punt? You're going to have boo birds in the stands in Clemson. So there's a lot of unrest. And for a Florida State fan who's been used to seeing that on the sidelines and in the stands here in Tallahassee, that's kind of nice to see on the other side for once. We can diagnose it pretty quickly around these parts. Yeah, and, uh, I, and, and, I'm, and I'm not sure. We may, we may not see DJ to start this game. Uh, as you mentioned, Tom, they did bench him in the last game out. Uh, he went back into the game. Uh, but, you know, Dabo is pretty more uh, open about their quarterback struggles uh, when he spoke to the media on Sunday than he has been in the past. He's In the past, he's kind of defended uh, DJ and their quarterback play. He's not doing that anymore. So I think that door may be open to, to them making a change, which may not be a good thing for Florida State. I think, you know, to the point Jeff was making about that interior offensive line, it's not – it's – you know, pressure, you can get pressure a bunch of different ways. You can bring defensive ends, you can bring blitzes. But if you get pressure up the middle, I mean, that can affect a quarterback in a way that, and I think that's what we're seeing with DJ. I mean, he he looks, he does not want to step up in the pocket. He doesn't want to run the football. He just looks tentative about everything he does. And so, and, and then that affects their play calling because now they get into second and seven or third and eight or certainly any kind of long distance situation they're not going to throw the ball. They're not going to ask him to make a tough throw unless it's, you know, just throw a, a deep ball down the sideline. They're not going to ask him to make any of those tough throws, and that limits what they can do offensively. And, and there's a lot of criticism right now of their uh, offensive coordinator, Tony Elliott, but I just think his hands are tied. They don't have a great running back like Travis Etienne. They don't have good quarterback play, and their offense is banged up. So, you know, Florida State's defense, you know, there's questions about whether or not they're as good as they've looked these last few weeks. They're going to get an opportunity to go up against a Clemson offense. It's the worst Clemson offense we've seen in, I mean, probably over a decade. 
been a moment, and we'll get a chance to break them down further in a second because there's more to digest here about what went wrong with Clemson and what they are, what Florida State's going to see this Saturday, 3.30 on ESPN. Don't forget, again, continue to check back throughout the week, warchant.com. More stories as we prepare you for this game. Of course, uh, wake up Warchant every morning, the Jeff Cameron Show, every afternoon from 1 to 3. And as I mentioned earlier, an opportunity post-game to get involved uh, when Tom and Gene host the post-game call-in show as well. More of the warchant.com report in a moment. Live and living color and totally free. Subscribe to Warchant TV on YouTube, the digital home of Warchant.com. From the practice field to pregame and the phone calls afterwards, Warchant's YouTube channel is home to live programming like Seminole Headlines, Wake Up Warchant, The Jeff Cameron Show, as well as Trench Talk, a live Q&A with Knowles offensive lineman Devontae Love-Taylor. Just search Warchant on YouTube and click or tap the subscribe button. That's it. It's totally free. Warchant TV on YouTube. Just another reason we're the ultimate Seminole sports source. Welcome back to the Warchant.com report. Time to take a good look here at what Clemson is, Florida State against Clemson's defense, Florida State's defense against Clemson's offense, and all of the rest. Before we get started, make sure you sub- you're subscribed to Warchant TV by clicking on the subscribe button on the bottom right of this video. Click on the bell to be notified of when new videos and live shows are available. We have the Jeff Cameron Show and Wake Up Warchant Monday through Friday. Some little headlines on Tuesdays. Trench Talk with FSU offensive lineman Devontae Love-Taylor on Monday. Monday nights, recruiting chats, and of course, the Sunday smash with Ira and myself. So make sure you do that by subscribing. Click the like button. Make sure we got the bell. As I said, Florida State Clemson 330 ESPN. Clemson's four and three. The Knowles are three and four. We're just excited to be talking about a game that seems like it has a chance to be very, very competitive. If you must know, you're a sporting guy or gal. Clemson begins the week as a 10-point favorite. Guys, we would have put this at around 25. I think Vegas had it 25 and a half, 30, somewhere in that neighborhood in the offseason. It was not pretty. Clemson hasn't covered a spread this year. Uh, they're basically averaging 17 points a game. They have really struggled. Uh, I'm going to say before we get to that side of it, let's talk about the side of the football that isn't struggling for Clemson. By every measure, Ira, they're a top 10 defense. Really, every advanced metric, everything you look at, they're still nasty on defense. So let's go with Florida State's offense. I'll lead the way with you against this defense. What can they get done against a unit that really has to win games for Clemson? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough sledding on that side of the ball. Um, You know, Florida State's identity is running the football, which is great, and it's served them well. Uh, and, And it will against most defenses, but Clemson's obviously very good. It's stopping the run. They're really good at everything. I think they're, uh, in just traditional uh, metrics, uh, they're one of the top three or four defenses in the country. And, uh, you know, they're just very experienced. You think about a guy like James Skowski, who's been on that defense since I think Tom was in middle school. Um, <laughs> I think the other day he had 18 tackles. We asked Mike Norvell about him this week, and he said it's amazing. He will he basically calls all of their defensive fronts. He uh, the One play he'll be blitzing off the edge and ne- or blitzing up the middle. The next play, he'll be playing in the deep third in the secondary, helping in coverage in his own. Uh, he's just a really experienced guy, and and they have a lot of experience and talent on that defense. Florida St- or Clemson has recruited incredibly well. We know they've had a lot of injuries this season, but they've still recruited. They've been one of the best recruiting teams uh, in the country for the last four or five years. Um, so there's a lot of talent, a lot of experience. And then they've got Brent Venables is the defensive coordinator who some people – say, argue well, he might be the best defensive coordinator in the country. So what they do is, and, and Kenny uh, Dillingham, FSU's offensive coordinator, spoke this week about it, they can bring a different defensive package, a different defensive game plan every week because they've got guys who are experienced enough to know how to do it, and they've got guys who are versatile enough to do different things. So I think Clemson's going to take about take away Florida, try to take away Florida State's running game. They're going to really try to key in on Jordan Travis. I'm sure they're going to try to be very physical with Jordan Travis. But the key to me, and I'm sure the key to Mike Norvell and Kane Dillingham, is FSU is going to have to hit some big plays. If you look at Pitt, Pitt scored two offensive touchdowns in that game when they beat him the other night. They were both on pretty longer, you know, 25 to 35 yard pass plays. Florida State's going to have to hit some big plays in the passing game and perhaps in the running game, uh, maybe in the in the zone read or you know get outside, make some play, make make somebody miss in space and try to break a long play because putting together long drives like they've been doing these last few games is probably not going to be on the table. Doesn't seem likely, and I think you make a great point because Pickett, who's one of the best quarterbacks in the country, started for Pitt, went 25 of 39. That means he completed 25 passes against this defense. That's 
not something you see all that often. I don't think it's a recipe that Florida State can match. They just don't have a passing quarterback in Jordan Travis that you want to throw the ball 30-plus times, and nor is he accurate enough, consistently enough, out of the pocket to hit 25 completions. So you're going to have to devise some big plays, like you said, down the field, these shot plays, uh, to try to keep Clemson honest. But it will be interesting to see if they can do that. Therein lies the great mystery. I'll ask you, Tom, if we flip sides on this, is there anything about Clemson's offense that you see that impresses you. I, I mentioned the inexperienced center, the rash of injuries inside. Uh, I know that on Clemson's website, they noted that like eight of their 25 top players, you know how we do the top 40 on warchant.com? They did one for their top 25 players. They're all lamenting the fact that eight of their starters are down uh, that at 25. Uh, they only average 17 points a game right now. It's been ugly. DJ, go back again in the game against Pitt. Tom, he uh, they tried 25 pass attempts. He wasn't good. Uh, I think no touchdowns, two interceptions. I think he completed uh, 12 passes. Anything impress you about what you see from Clemson right now? And uh, is Florida State secondary legitimately better, or did they just play bad teams? Uh, there's lots to unpack there. You know, if you just go by the numbers, Clemson doesn't impress you in any way. When you can't hit 20 points and clear the 20 point margin and regulation against this ACC, which I don't think anybody is is revising their stance on the relative talent of the ACC against the rest of Power Five this season, it's not good. If you can't hit into the 20s against those groups, then there's really nothing positive if you're looking at the paper. However, you know, the potential of these athletes is still dangerous. And and if uh, Pumachan is indeed a starter this week or he plays a lot more, uh, his threat with his legs, given what Florida State was unable to do against a Garrett Schrader and to a degree, even Sam Howell, even though the game plan was to let Sam Howell run a little bit more, you're worried about broken plays and, and you're running, worried about read options and speed options being able to burn you on the ground with a quarterback. Um, Justin Ross at any point could go off for a bunch of catches and a bunch of yards against the secondary that's been run by in the early part of the season. Uh, Joseph Ngata was not available last week against Pitt, but they do think he's going to be back this week. That means that they're going to have two weapons on the outside for whatever quarterback is throwing it their way. It, it, while Clemson can't necessarily, they can't block it up with any, any consistency and they lost another interior offensive lineman this week. You're still just worried about the potential of those athletes. I'm sure it's probably what a lot of markets said about Florida State in 2016 and 2017 if they were previewing that matchup, which is they still have a lot of blue chippers. So if you allow extra time for the quarterback, you devise up a protection, you roll them out, I mean, and you let those guys go win one on one. Uh, and Gata had 100 yards against Georgia's defense to open up the season. They didn't score an offensive touchdown, but he showed out. If you look at the touchdown catch he made against Syracuse, getting his foot down. That's an unbelievably acrobatic and athletic play. So the potential is there for Clemson. And then to answer the question about the Florida State secondary, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, the competition got worse. Garrett Schrader can't complete a forward pass beyond five yards down the field, but Sam Howell sure can. And in certain situations, Florida State made some big plays. I'm thinking about a contested pass by Jamie Robinson out into the right side. It was on a third down. The 50-50 ball that Jerry on Jones comes down with for an interception. You see the improved uh, confidence from somebody like Jarvis Brownlee, who dropped a pick six last weekend only to make it up and totally redeem himself with some awesome dance moves that you mentioned all throughout the week. I think it's a combination of a couple things with that secondary, but confidence matters. And if uh, Uyungale, excuse me, Uyungale, I knew I was going to do that, or Pumachan don't have a ton of time and you can cut off a couple of routes, I could see a situation where the secondary makes some plays this weekend. So uh, it's a mess on that side, but we'll see who's worse is worse, if that makes sense. This is how big of a mess it is on that side. They're 121st in points scored. How in the hell is Clemson 121st in points scored per game? It just seems absolutely remarkable. Against that but, schedule. It, it's Georgia I mean, Tech, Syracuse, Boston College. What are we doing? That speaks to something more than just the physical woes on the offensive line. It speaks to some problems internally. And one of those problems is that DJ refuses to run the ball. If, in fact, he sat down, I think it's for that reason. I think they're tired of it because – you're going to call plays for your quarterback. You guys both know this. If the interior of your line can't block it up and you've got a guy that can move, you're going to roll him out and give him a run pass option. You're going to cut the field in half and say, if it's there, throw it. If not, go. And he won't even do that. And they tried to get him to do it. I've watched those games. You can see the mounting frustration on their staff's faces. He will not do it. It is bizarre. So at this point, I would suspect that if he refuses here and they can't block Florida State in the middle and they're getting pressure up the gut, they they may make a change at quarterback if they decide even to start him to begin with. When we come back, we'll give you the keys to the game and our predictions. That's all next on the warchant.com report.
Welcome back to the WarChant.com report. In a moment, we'll get to the keys to the game. Let's take a look first at what the rest of the staff here at WarChant.com predicted for this game. Man, I, I, if you look at these two teams and you didn't, you forget about the names and you just watch what happened on the field the last couple of games, you'd say Florida State has the better team and they may have the better team. But boy, history's a bitch. You know, I, I just can't get past the fact that Florida State is 0-7 against its three big rivals. Uh, the past few years, and it's not just they've lost those games. They've lost in horribly convincing fashion. The margin of victory is 42 to 14 in those seven losses, and this may be the best chance they have to win one of those. Clemson's offense is horrific. It's one of the worst maybe I've seen uh, from the Tigers. They are averaging uh, in the teens. I don't think they've scored more than 19 points against an FBS opponent. They have not covered the spread all year. So Florida State is certainly capable of going out of Memorial Stadium and coming back with a big-ass plot of sod. And if they do, man, let's big, dig a nice big hole in the sod cemetery because that's going to be a nice one. But can I pick the upset? No, I can't do it yet. I just uh, – my head is beaten down with all those bad losses to rivals. I do think – little spoiler here. I think Florida State's going to beat a rival this year. I'm just not going to pick this game. But – Florida State's going to keep it close. Clemson's not going to cover. Once again, I'm picking Clemson 20, <laughs> Florida State 13. They're going to hang in there. I wouldn't be surprised if they pull the upset, but I can't make that pick just yet. So hang in there. Should be a fun Saturday, Memorial Stadium. That's my pick. Hopefully I'm wrong. We'll see next week. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be a tough game. It's Clemson, right? Um and I do think Florida State has a chance to win this game. I think your defensive line is better than their offensive line. Um, and I think your offense will give them some issues with the uh, the Panda Express backfield with uh, our Sean gone, whatever you want to call him, with uh, Jordan Travis as the quarterback. I just think that's a tough ask because that's a tough place to play. They have not, won they have not lost there in 30, 31 games. Um, you have not traditionally played well on the road, and I think win or lose, if you're in a game in the fourth quarter with Clemson, even this Clemson team, that is a positive step. I just think maybe the environment um, and that Clemson defense that doesn't give up a lot of points to anyone um, is going to be a little too tough at the end of the day. So I'm going with Clemson 27, <laughs> Florida State 20. Peace. Hope I'm wrong. Peace. And I'm going with the Knowles. I'm going with Florida State to beat Clemson this Saturday, 24 to 20. And if you look at this game, this these are two teams moving in the opposite direction right now with the month of October that Florida State has had. Uh, I think Florida State's got a much better shot at controlling this game offensively than Clemson's going to have. And I've got Florida State in, in a lot of streaks on Saturday. They're 0-5 in their last five against Clemson going back to 2015. Uh, Clemson has, has, of course, won uh, 31 straight home games going back to 2016. And don't forget, Florida State is 1-8 and in Death Valley going back to 2001. So Florida State, all those streaks are going down this Saturday, and Florida State is going to come on top against Clemson 24 to 20. So this is kind of difficult. If you take all your emotion out of this and you just watch the last three, four weeks, you pick Florida State, no problem. Uh, but for me, emotion gets involved because I'm not a data analytics guy. I still don't think, I still don't think Jordan Travis is a great quarterback. I just don't. But he's better than Clemson's quarterback, DJ Uwe Ungalule. I could say it. Florida State, the way they're running the ball right now in practice, whether it's outside the tackles, between the tackles, shotgun handoffs, toss sweeps. I mean, good luck trying to defend him for 60 minutes. It's just, it's impossible. I can't stand it. I don't like it. I think it's gimmicky. But when it's your guy, you embrace it. So let's embrace it. Florida State 27, Clemson 24. We'll get to our predictions in just a moment. But first, let's circle back to these keys to the game, guys. I really believe for Florida State over the coming weeks, the keys are going to be pretty simple and straightforward. And I think it's true of this game, just like it will be true of some of the other games. Make teams earn it. You're seeing ACC teams really struggle. Uh, teams that don't have picket at quarterback, for example, have really had a hard time sustaining drives and putting together 10, 12, 13 play drives. Florida State gave up so many busts early in the season that they just made life so easy on their opponents. Lately, one thing they've done is done a real good job of cutting down on all of those mistakes. The communication has been so much better. Clemson, of all teams, has shown that perhaps more than any other in this conference, they simply can't put together 
10, 12, 13 play drives. Now, as Tom alluded to earlier, they can put together a big play because they've got talent out on the edges. And if you're going to let them run by you and you're not going to cover them, well, they'll score. But if you force them to repeatedly drive the football down the field, I don't think they can do it. So I would suggest you keep everything in front of you. You try to hope that front four can win those battles against the offensive line. You frustrate Clemson. You play it close to the vest and you make this a field position game because I'm not so sure Florida State's going to move the ball at will either against this Clemson defense. Just don't get give up the big play. I know it sounds easier said than done, and I know it certainly sounds simple, but Florida State has shown lately that they can communicate better, and Clemson has shown they can't put together sustained drives. Which way do you want to go? Ira, your prediction, buddy. How's it work? Keys. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think uh, to echo what you said, but maybe a little twist on it. I do think Adam Fuller has to d- d- dial up some pressure. I think they need to, you know, maybe there's some blitzes that he they've worked on, but they haven't thrown it out in a game yet. Give DJ something to see that he hasn't seen yet because we know he's teetering. If he's the guy that he's been teetering with his confidence as it is, uh, I don't think you want to let – you don't want to be too passive to where he can find some comfort level if that exists for him this season. Um, offensively, though, to me the biggest thing is just keep doing what you're doing. They have to continue to protect the football, which they've done a great job of, and not have penalties. If they can do that and stay in front of the change, give themselves a chance. I mean, Kenny Dillingham has talked at length about – how different their drives are, are if they get into second and seven or even second and eight or second and nine as opposed to second and 15, it changes everything for them. So they just got to stay away from those negative plays and the turnovers. And then, you know, if you could just hit one or two of those big plays, I believe they will scheme up a couple shots. Just hit one or two of them. And I get I think that gives you a really good chance to win this football game. Tommy, where are you going with this? Yeah, I think to Ira's last point, it's almost like facing a team like Georgia Tech back in the day where if you're going to run it so much, there's going to be something at some point open over the top, at least in a one-on-one situation because, it, you know, look at the ratio against UMass. It's 45 to 15 run the pass. When they could have worked on stuff, they still decided that this is going to be the identity moving forward. We're going to run the ball a hell of a lot more than we're going to throw the ball. So if you get those chances, hit on them. Uh, one of the keys on defense has to be for the interior to show up and remind Clemson's interior of their offensive line that it's been a long season and it's going to be another long day. Because if you can do that, then I think it gets kind of fun for the secondary. If you see little plays out to the flat, quick throws, you might be able to cheat on some of those. Get greedy. I'm not talking about another pick six necessarily, but you might be able to jump some routes because you trust the front four in front of you to win their battles. So the clock is moving faster. We see this a lot, Jeff, with our pro team. You know, if you're bringing a lot of pressures and there's a double move, don't worry about that second move. You're going to get home in time to complete and jump the route on the first part of whatever play they're designing. So I think that's the key for the interior of the defensive line to establish what they're doing and and what has been happening to Clemson, remind them in the past weeks. And the other part I'd say on special teams, because if this game is going to be as close as the rest of Clemson's games, you can't lose the hidden yardage battle like Florida State lost even to UMass to a degree. On kickoffs, there you go. Fair catch, take the ball at the 25-yard line, and if you're kicking the ball, try and kick it through the end zone. You don't want cheap yardage to be given Clemson's way to get that crowd going. Don't give them an excuse. You were talking about on defense. Keep the plays in front of you. On special teams, don't let anything cheap happen to put you behind the chains or field position leverage, and don't allow them free field position leverage. So it's the moment of truth, boys. Have we talked ourselves into a Florida State win prediction Or do we think that is a bridge too far as they go on the road and take on a team that hasn't lost in 31 straight home games or whatever it is? Uh, I'll start with you, Ira. Let's go, big man. Who do you got? Wah, wah, wah. (laughs) I, uh, yeah, you know, I want to do it, man. But a long time ago in a previous life when I, when I was managing editor of VegasInsider.com, some of the great handicappers we had would tell, uh, remind me frequently to not bet against streaks. And uh, I can't do it, man. Clemson has won 31 straight games at home. They've beaten Florida State five straight times. Um, I think if, if all things were equal, if, if these two teams didn't have names on their, uh, you know, in we, this history, I think I'd pick Florida State possibly. Uh, but because it's on the road and because of all those streaks, uh, I'm going to take Clemson uh, 20 to 17. Yeah, that's playing uh, to the defensive-minded uh, result that a lot of people expect to see. Tom, uh, are you calling for the upset here? You know, I, I thought you were in the beginning of the show when you said that the post-game show is going to be a celebratory one. So I was wondering. Yeah, it's, a, it's a tease. It's a tease for okay. the show. Yeah. Well, then I'll give you the opportunity. Do you want to do it first? 
You want to be the first one? To call yeah, it? yeah I'll, I'll go ahead and, and go first. And and I, uh, I'm sorry to be a sourpuss as well, but I'll join Ira. Wow, uh, wow, I, yeah, wow. it is. You know, I actually have it 23 to 14, Clemson. I, I think it's going to be tough sledding for Florida State. I said earlier this week that I think Florida State's got to find a way to complete somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 to 18 passes against this Clemson defense to loosen them up. I think you got to throw it a little over 20 times. I just don't really believe Florida State's equipped to do that and have a lot of success. Now, my hope is that I'm wrong and that they do do what Iris says and they lean into it and they they run the ball and they play field position, but that puts a lot of stress on this defense to not give up anything. And I just think that uh, it's probably going to be too much to ask. I'll, I'll take Clemson to win the game 23 to 14, but it is, it is winnable. It is winnable. And 100%. I never thought I would say that it is winnable for Florida state. They need some good things happen to them. Like I said, all along, uh, but I can't predict it. I, I think Clemson wins 23, 14. Uh, I like that 23 number. I just think that Florida State is going to get to the 23, and Clemson will get to a mere 16 points, sir. I'm, mm. I'm doing it. I'm calling for it. And here's why. I think there are legitimate reasons here beyond the fact that you know Clemson is, is struggling. If you look at the COVID-19 stuff that they've been going through in previous weeks, Joseph and Gata should be back for them at receiver, but Kobe Pace is out, and he's by far their best runner. they got Will Shipley, who we'll see Good what player. he can do. He's a good player, but Kobe Pace is the guy that would have scared me on the scout. When we were doing the, the outline and we received it earlier today, I thought, all right, I'm going to talk about, oh, I don't have to talk about Kobe Pace. What is this? And they've got uh, more injuries to the interior of the offensive line. You've got a burgeoning quarterback question. Those don't magically go away during a game. They continue. Every time you fail on a drive, you can feel that little atmosphere in the stands where the fans are almost turning against the home team. Uh, you've got Dabo making silly comments. You, I mean, all of those boxes that you're looking to check, Clemson's making noise for all the wrong reasons. Meanwhile, Florida State had a bye week in UMass, so they've been preparing for this game for a long time. It's just, and, and obviously Clemson is coming off of a tough road loss at Pitt, who's a good team this year. You're looking for freshness factor. You're looking for continuity and confidence. Florida State checks all those boxes. Clemson doesn't, so I think FSU pulls out the win. I hope you're right. There's certainly no harm in calling for it. 23 to 16 is Tom's prediction. Me and Ira were the two sour pusses, as I say. But I know this. Uh, we will all celebrate if, in fact, that upset happens in a way that we did not anticipate. The fact that we even believe it's possible is uh, a sign of real progress. So don't forget to check out all the latest stuff on Warchant.com, as always. We'll get you all set for the game and, of course, uh, the post game afterwards as well. And then join Ira and myself on the Sunday Smash. We'll react to this game as well Sunday evening at seven o'clock in fact we look forward to it our thanks to aslan for tom and for ira i'm jeff thanks to all of you go Knowles, and we'll talk to you next time on the warchant.com report